What do Lovecraft, Hollow Knight, Nier Automata, and Dark Souls all have in common? One, the founding writer of Cosmic Horror, one, a dark mythic fantasy Metroidvania, one, a melodramatic JRPG packed full of philosophy, and one, a grim dark fantasy series built on its difficulty. Are they all games? No. Are they all made by great people? Uh, definitely not. No. They're all stories that use soft world building to immerse you in their story worlds, and we're gonna talk about how. Two years ago, I released On Writing and World Building Volume 1, and it uh, did way better than expected, like 30,000 copies sold, so thank you very much. It's also now being published in South Korea. It's a codified version of the Writing and World Building series, edited and rewritten, put into a book that is way easier to study and reference. And at last, Volume 2 is here! in December. Provided you help me pick the cover art between these themes. You can vote for it in the community tab now, but also just let me know down below. I like having you guys involved. Not only does volume two cover everything from writing fight scenes to redemption arcs to hard and soft world building, all of these topics, but I put way more effort into volume two. I'm proud to say it has 12,000 words worth of extra detail on all of these topics, and so much of it has just been rewritten from the ground up. Better examples, more depth, just way better. December 1st, vote. Hardware building immerses you through realistic politics, religions, economics, geography, that sort of thing. What we can call the objective consistency of a world, with everything working together to fit into this believable framework. The most famous example you're probably familiar with is Game of Thrones. The show skyrocketed to popularity around 2013, partly because of how well it did this, showing us the realistic political struggles of a post-revolution world after Robert's Rebellion, economics having real consequences for warfare, it showed us how the religions of the old and new gods realistically affected the cultures of the north and south, Westeros felt real, it was familiar in its own way while also being totally its own thing. Part of the reason that the later seasons felt less immersive is that they kind of lost that objective consistency that they had immersed us with before, at least that was definitely the case for me. Suddenly, the world just made a lot less sense. Well, Danny kind of forgot about the Iron Fleet. <laughs> but, contrary to what a lot of world builders out there seem to say, realism is not the only way we get immersed in a world. Salt world builders immerse people through what I like to call the experiential consistency of a world, where everything fits into creating a specific emotional, psychological, or thematic experience, even if it's not realistic. And we do this all the time. Once you hear about it, you're going to see it everywhere. A simple example would be the towers of neatly stacked trash in WALL-E. Taller than skyscrapers, built out of these little cubes, but with no real structural integrity, they definitely would have fallen over and scattered in the hundreds or thousands of years, but they're there to make a literal monument to our waste, to make us feel like small things that have created such devastation in the world. It's not realistic world building. The world could not have ended up like this but it does invoke real emotions, a real experience, and that is immersive. H.P. Lovecraft's Cthulhu Mythos is itself world building. He gives us strange aliens and vast cities and ancient histories and pantheons. But I think it goes without saying that Lovecraft did not design the creatures of his world to be a realistic exploration of aliens and interdimensional beings, but to create that sensation of cosmic horror, that you have come up against powers so much greater than yourself, incomprehensible, such that knowing them may drive you mad. Just listen to how he describes his creations, the great old ones and elder things and outer gods. A pulpy, tentacled head surmounted a grotesque and scaly body with rudimentary wings, with an octopus-like head whose face was a mass of feelers, a scaly, rubbery-looking body, prodigious claws on hind and forefeet, and long, narrow wings behind. 
a thing of somewhat bloated corpulence. They were mostly shiny and slippery, but the ridges of their backs were scaly, with prodigious bulging eyes that never closed. At the sides of their necks were palpitating gills and their long paws were webbed. They hopped irregularly, sometimes on two legs and sometimes on four. I was somehow glad that they had no more than four limbs. Their croaking, baying voices held all the dark shades of expression which their staring faces lacked. There's a reason that Lovecraft created these creatures with tentacles, scales, and slimy skin, moving in irregular ways, and it's not because he wanted to be realistic. Lovecraft uses the most foreign features he can in describing them, ones that we associate with danger, death, places unfit for human habitation. They make us uncomfortable, it's meant to alienate us, make us feel unsafe, that we are around nothing familiar. That description of bloated corpulence conjures images of disease and sickness. He juxtaposes features that we do not imagine belong together in the natural world to give them a sense of wrongness, pointing out how this character finds some little comfort in the creature having just four legs, an even, familiar number, and a creature that feels like it otherwise should not exist. Everything resists the categorization that humans are so inclined towards. And Lovecraft regularly plays with the uncanny valley, that horrifying, squirmy feeling you get when you look at something that's close to looking human, but not, that it's a little off. These figures were seldom completely human, but often approached humanity in varying degrees. And worst of all, they never spoke or laughed, and never smiled because they had no faces at all to smile with, but only a suggestive blankness where a face ought to be. What literally gives us about the environment they live in has very little to do with what might naturally give rise to these features, or where creatures like these might naturally live. He didn't care about any of that. I mean, he just tells us, oh yeah, by the way, they can just all travel through space. He wanted to play with human comfort, the bounds of what is familiar and expected, what we can empathize with. A weird thing about humanity is that if we see something's eyes, we can more easily empathize with it. Hence this cute spider animation with big eyes. Hi. But in Lovecraft stories, eyes are nearly always vacant, staring, soulless, or in clusters. The universe has no empathy for us in his mind, and that's because Lovecraft wanted his world building to explore cosmic indifference. The idea that the universe does not care about humanity, about keeping us alive or killing us, that it has no real purpose, that it is indifferent to us. Even the cities that Lovecraft created were designed to reflect this idea, yet now the sway of reason seemed irrefutably shaken, for the cyclopean maze of squared, curved, and angled blocks had features which cut off all comfortable refuge. It was, very clearly, the blasphemous city of the mirage and stark, objective, and ineluctable reality. Only the incredible, unhuman massiveness of these vast stone towers and ramparts had saved that frightful thing from utter annihilation in the hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of years it had brooded there. That whole non-Euclidean geometry thing, yeah, that's all designed to make us feel lost and small. Now, while Lovecraft does actually go into how the civilization of the Elder Things might have worked in At the Mountains of Madness, the trade, society, even suggesting a socialist political structure, any objective consistency is clearly secondary to that experiential consistency to whatever leaves the reader with that sense of cosmic horror and indifference that immerses us in this powerful experience. But we are talking Lovecraft, and while I can say that his stories are interesting, I do want to caveat that by saying that these stories are explicitly and rampantly racist, and there are better Cthulhu mythos writers out there now who you can read instead. It is not subtle, and it may hamper your ability to enjoy these stories, and that is totally okay. None of this is to say that you can't imbue your heart world building with that thematic, psychological, or emotional meaning and experience. You absolutely can, and I think these stories did some of that as well. But it's a spectrum, and I think that these strategies are often used pretty independently of one another to immerse people in different ways. Where hard world building immerses us through its consistency and transparency, consciously communicating the concrete rules of the world to create a grounded sense of realism and depth, 
Soft world building will often consciously use the unknown, flexible rules, and involve your imagination to create this experience. And I mean, throughout all of this, it's so clear how Lovecraft consciously uses the unknown against you, using the reader's imagination to create this immersive experience. Hollow Knight is a 2017 metroidvania developed by Team Cherry. Based in Hallownest, a kingdom of insects once ruled by the Pale King, a great worm who could give sentient thought to the bugs who lived there, it has all since collapsed into ruin following a devastating plague of sorts. The City of Tears is a central location in the game, and it's atmospherically defined and set apart from the rest of the game world by its constant rain. Now, the game world actually takes place underground, so it's actually water seeping through the cracks in the cave roof from the lake above, but the rain isn't here in the City of Tears because this is a grounded exploration of the geology of this world. It's just not. Firstly, it wouldn't disperse like rain like this, and a lot of bugs can't survive the heavy water, and there is not a clear drainage system in the city that would prevent all of its rooms from getting flooded. But none of that matters. Don't really care. As someone pointed out, I had to laugh at one of the replies on a Reddit post about this, the Pale King sure is an amazing architect. It's not trying to immerse us with that objective consistency. It is all about that experiential consistency. It constantly rains in the City of Tears to create a melancholic atmosphere, to feel that sadness for all that has been lost here, something that we have always identified with rain. There's a line from a character called Quirrell who describes the place in saying, The capital lies before us, my friend. What a somber place it seems, and one that holds the answers to many a mystery. This is the City of Tears, after all. The blue and purple colour scheme of the architecture captures this as well, even if in reality the city might be a bit more varied, after all it's heavily populated, or was. Everything here is aimed at invoking that sombre feeling in the player, that palpable emptiness that they wanted to resonate with you. The rain and colours have no impact on gameplay, they're purely world building decisions, but they all create that consistent emotional experience. That is soft world building and it's immersive. And the game is full of this kind of stuff. It's all over the place. The world was ravaged by a pandemic, but you won't find a realistic exploration of the social and economic consequences. Again, doesn't matter, don't care. And if you care, that's your fault. You won't find anti-mask protesters and anti-vaxxer movements here. It just does not matter. Everything we learn about it focuses on the sense of loss of a mystical, even mythical place, like we have left the Garden of Eden. The creators spoke about how they wanted you to feel like a lone explorer digging deeper and deeper into a strange world underground. If that's the case, then they did that brilliantly. Everything fits into that psychological experience. A sense of wonder, of being lost, of our fear of depths that draws us deeper into the dark. Of being a small thing who slowly learns to navigate the world. Hello Nest is filled with this kind of evocative world building designed to inspire particular emotions and sensations in you, regardless of whether it's strictly realistic. But I also want to point out that Hollow Knight has a lot of hard world building too, that they struck a balance, that it's not a binary choice between purely hard and purely soft, that you can mix and match, that it's kind of more of like a spectrum. And that leads us on to... Nier Automata is... Uh, well that's the question, isn't it? It's one of the best games I have ever played, and one of the most powerful stories I have ever experienced. And given my love for soft world building, it might partly be why. I create games and write stories, but my goal is to cause an emotional stir inside the player's brain. This is a young girl's hometown. Sandy air, yellow skies are what you see and what stands out. But the atmosphere of the village is very somber, caused by the sad event of the girl's death. By seeing the scene in this manner, the image is embedded in your head as a setting in the game. The world will gradually start to form itself around these emotional beats. Yoko Taro was talking about how he wrote a previous game in the series here, but it speaks to how he immerses you in the story world as well. He visualizes his world building in whatever form creates that emotional stir, whatever supports that the most. In other words, that experiential consistency, which comes out pretty damn vividly in Nier Automata. 
In Nier Automata, Earth has long been taken over by these cute and sad robots who you care about so much and you just want them to be happy and I will protect you at all co- Your mission is to kill them, until you learn that these robots are simulating human society. Monarchies, religions, even family structures with fathers and sons, mothers and daughters. Taro deals with themes of transhumanism, consciousness and constructed meaning in doing this. That even if we make something up, that doesn't mean that it's not real on some level, or that it doesn't matter. He wants you to empathise with the cute little robots and by god does he succeed! With that in mind, Yoko Taro built the world of Nier Automata to do just that. Damn how unrealistic it might be, it was all for that particular experience. There are well preserved medieval ruins, somehow right next to a working theme park, right next to a city composed entirely of apartment buildings, next to a European forest which is next to a desert. You find a group of these robots who have appointed a monarch for themselves, they've got knights and suits of armour and a sense of chivalry and loyalty. They love and care for their king. It seems Taro knew that medieval ruins probably wouldn't be found here, that they wouldn't have survived this long into the future, but again, who cares, didn't matter, because of course those themes of constructed meaning would be more visceral if he set this group of robots in a place like this. As they find purpose in this fictional kingdom of sorts that they have made and carved out for themselves, setting it in this medieval setting helps them and helps us believe in it more, say than if it was just set in the ruins of New York. It helps us empathise and understand them, and through that, we engage with the themes of the story. The same goes for much of the rest of the setting, everything is designed to support those themes that Taro wanted to explore. Yoko Taro wanted us to feel heartbroken when we understand that their beloved king is dead and that they've been desperately trying for so damn long to continue the kingdom without him, trying to find a new monarch, to have a child and heir but they can't. The ever crumbling ruins fit in perfectly with that, that sad feeling of inevitable decline. Something that, again, just the ruins of a city I don't think would have done as well. He world built to stir that emotion in us, and everything fits into that emotional and thematic experience. In other words, the world has experiential consistency. Dark Souls is a game about uh, dying from what I can tell, judging from my experience. In many ways Dark Souls mimics Lovecraft's themes of cosmic indifference in its world building. Unsurprising from the creator who went on to then make Bloodborne, an explicitly Lovecraftian work. The creatures and world are intentionally hostile, they are unfamiliar, they resist categorization in the same way, all to create that sense of cosmic alienation even if it's not realistic world building. We've already covered that so I won't focus on it. Instead, we'll talk about how Dark Souls' world explores death and rebirth. In Dark Souls' world, these divisions between life and death have become lost, and the world is eternally caught in a state of undeath, between collapse and continuance, it is instead a withering, putrefying, deathless corpse in itself. Its spaces, the cathedrals, castles, caves, sewers, fortifications and forest huts are hollow bodies, locked in processes of organic decay. A descent through the ringed city only seems to strengthen this idea. It is a structure which at its highest point is drained of colour, dry and calcified, but as you descend becomes fetid, waterlogged, sinking into its own fluids. The ringed city and the world around it is a strange place that you probably wouldn't find if you were genuinely trying to realistically world build. But that doesn't matter, doesn't matter, don't care, I don't care at all, because of course, that's not the point. Dark Souls doesn't immerse us through its realistic use of religion and architecture, it never did. It immerses you through themes and sensations that permeate the world building, it's that sense of experiential consistency into which its gothic architecture perfectly fits. And like with Hollow Knight, Dark Souls is a mixture of hard world building and soft world building. Lovecraft, Hollow Knight, Nier Automata and Dark Souls are also marked out by something else as well, how little they tell us about how their world works. The unknown is such a big part of the atmosphere, the vibe, that's really the only word for it in these stories, and leaving these gaps, not explaining things, invites the reader and player to imagine, to become involved in the storytelling process. And that's immersive. 
I mean, Dungeons and Dragons has been doing that for decades, telling collaborative stories. The flexibility of these worlds, less concerned with transparency and realism, allows them to construct a place that best delivers on these themes, emotions, and experiences. It's the same reason that extremely hard world build stories do explain a lot, but not the parts that they know are far-fetched. They just want you to buy into the illusion that they have created, and that's okay. That's part of this kind of storytelling. I don't want you to feel like you have to justify everything you create, that you have to come up with a perfectly rational or in-text reason that everything has to work the way it does. You can just create experiences for the reader, and a lot of people will love it. If you're immersed in a world, chances are someone else will be as well. But that's it. I really like talking about these stories. And I just want to say thank you to all of you for your support over the last year and since forever. I mean, the success of Volume 1 was just so unexpected for me. It genuinely was. And I really hope that you like Volume 2, that it's helpful in some way. Over the last while, I've experimented a bit with my style and content, trying to find new ways of doing things, while also trying to deliver on the stuff that I know you guys love. And I just want to say thanks again for kind of the support as I've tried to do that. Views have gone up and down and up and down, and it drives me a little bit crazy because it's sometimes hard to know if it's working or not. But uh, there are a lot of metrics of success that, you know, I am doing well at. This year I haven't just been making videos, I've been writing short stories and submitting them to magazines, and shockingly it's working. And also finishing my fiction book, which I was gonna try and get out before volume two, but that just didn't quite work. But the book is done, the book is done and going to publishers and stuff. And it's all a mess to get all of this done at the same time. But thank you, because you really have made it work. Stay nerdy and I'll see you